Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Looks like Zoom is still letting people in slowly, so we'll give it just a moment for all of you to get settled. I'd like to welcome you back for our third, third Thursday Native Plants at Noon. Try saying that one five times fast. Today's installment is part of a continuing series being presented in partnership with the Missouri Department of Conservation to bring you virtual native plant education all year round. Please continue to join us the third Thursday of every month for live presentations from the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. Next month, join us for double the fun as we have native plants at noon on both April 15th and again on Earth Day, April 22nd. So we look forward to seeing you again then. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the comments on the Facebook live feed. Uh, we have over 500 people registered for these webinars and we're trying to constrain our time to fit in that 30 minutes that some of you may have for your lunch break uh, as best we can. So we know we won't get to answer every question, uh, but we'll take a few as we go along and then some time at the end. Uh, and if we don't get to yours, uh, please feel free to reach out to either the presenters or to me and we're happy to connect you with answers. Once again, please join me in welcoming Alex Daniel and Sydney Ross. Uh, if you can't tell yet, Alex and Sydney have a lot of fun with their job. They're both native landscape specialists with the Missouri Department of Conservation at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. Um, they help keep the landscape there looking wonderful um, for all of us to visit. So um, we are so glad to have them back again. Sydney and Alex, thank you for being here. Thanks, Sarah. Thank Thanks you. for having us. So I'm Sydney. And I'm Alex. And we're so excited to have you all here today joining us for our third installment of Native Plants at Noon. Today we'll be discussing winter plants, or rather winter weeds, and what you should do with them. So to start us off, we're first going to talk about this really important list. So Alex, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we wanted to show, this is the uh, Missouri, uh, Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force list for the top invasive plants that are expanding in Missouri. And we're going to talk about a few of these plants. Um, this is just a really good resource to get started with, you know, if you're trying to um, uh, uh, restore an area or you're trying to find out what your plant, what kind of plants you have in your yard that might be invasive, non-native, and that need to be removed, this is a great place to start. So Sarah will link to that list mm -hmm. in the chat. Perfect. So, but before we begin talking about, uh, uh, we're going to talk about five species today uh, that are considered weeds. First, we thought we'd go over a few definitions um, that you might see popping up in literature or kind of research or any kind of mention about these plants in general. Um, so Alex, can you first, first of all, define what is a native plant? What, what a great question, <laughs> Sydney. We maybe should have started on episode one with what it's a native plant. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. So and there are some controversial um, definitions of what a native plant is, but basically the most important thing about a native plant is that it's a plant that has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years with our native fauna. And so it's got a very um, uh, specific role in our uh, ecosystems here. Um, so these are plants that are host plants for our native insects, they're food plants for our native birds, um, they're cover plants for our native um, birds and wildlife also. Um, these are plants that have been important to these animals and insects for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a really uh, tight connection there and that there, it's a very complicated connection. So I would imagine it'd be hard to just swap out um, plants that are native that have evolved for this amount of time with plants that maybe came over here, like let's say in the 1800s. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of plants have been brought over here, um, uh, either for culinary reasons or for um, uh, landscape um, horticulture reasons too, because they grow well. And um, they have escaped cultivation and have gotten out of control out in the landscape and are now detrimental to our native landscapes. Um, they, they crowd out our native plants. They remove resources for our native um, wildlife and their problem. Now, they're not all like that. So that's what we're going to talk about today is a level of weediness and how important it is to actually remove some of these plants and some of them that you don't really need to worry about. Interesting. Okay. So 
Before we jump into the different levels of weediness, can you tell us what's the, what is your definition of a weed? That seems like a really common word that's thrown around. So how do you define that? So uh, your my definition of a weed is a plant that doesn't belong somewhere. So there, not belong can mean a lot of things for a lot of different reasons. It sounds pretty subjective. Yes, it is. So um, if you're talking about a very formal garden bed where you have some native plants incorporated, you might only have three species that you intentionally want to keep in that garden bed. So that means everything else is considered a weed, no matter if it's native or non-native. But if you're talking about a bigger, like, like a remnant prairie, let's say, that's getting, um, that's uh, 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 being infested with like Cerecia lespedeza or bush honeysuckle. Um, these are non-native invasive plants that are making their way into these really tight-knit, very precious communities that we don't have very much left of. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's a huge problem and why um, so many steps are taken to eradicate these species from our natural areas. Interesting, okay, so uh, let's back up just a little bit. So we've talked about what a native plant is, we've talked about what a weed is, which is really just subjective and depends on your goal for that area. Now, can you tell us uh, what's the difference between, uh, or can you just define non-native? I hear a lot of people talk about non-native plants. Now, does that mean all non-native plants are bad? No, not, not necessarily. So we're going to talk about the baddest of the bad, the top one in Kansas City, and then we're going to go down in levels of weediness to uh, the, the fourth one we're going to talk about is a non-native but naturalized plant. And then the fifth one we're going to talk about is a native plant that is considered a weed by a lot of gardeners and homeowners. Cool. So there's all these different definitions out there. And the most important thing to keep in mind is, especially when you're dealing with native plants, and gardening with native plants, um, who are you doing it for? Is it for, for you? Is it for, for your personal aesthetic? Or is it for nature? Are you trying to attract nature? Are you trying to feed the insects and bugs that are in your yard or in your community? Right. Maybe so. we can find a way to bridge that gap and do both. You know, it's important. I love aesthetics. You know, I think it's really important to have a well-designed garden but I don't want to just do it for myself. Like right. you're saying, let's do it for beyond ourselves. Yeah. So, And there are some, some species, and a lot of this is about time management as well, because there are some species you should spend the time to get rid of. And there are other species that maybe they're non-native, but they're not worth your time trying to get rid of because right. they provide a little bit of ecological value or maybe even some edibility. Yeah, yeah. so we'll find yeah. out about that. Yeah. So, so let's start off with the worst of the worst. Right. So we're going to do the first one. So the first plant I'm going to be talking about today is bush honeysuckle. Now this is a plant you're going to see a lot of, and actually we have a an actual bush honeysuckle plant here. So I'm going to back up so you can see the whole thing. And then I'm going to come up here. Sorry, watch your cut. <laughs> it's a big one. It's a big, bad plant. So you can see right now, if you look in the landscape here in Kansas City and in Missouri in general, you're probably seeing this plant start to leaf out. It's one of the first, um, I will say harbingers of spring. Unfortunately, this plant is one of the worst invasive species we have here in Kansas City. If you look in your parks, it's everywhere. And I'll dive into why it's a bad plant, but it is on that top invasive uh, plant list that are expanding in Missouri. I believe it's number seven, is that right? Yes, it's number seven on this list, the okay. invasive bush honeysuckles. So this plant, let me hand this back to you, um, it came from Eastern Asia in the 1800s. It was brought over for ornamental landscaping. Um, the, the, it has red berries in the fall. So I think they thought, oh, this could be a really great plant for birds. Um, but as it turns out, bush honeysuckle is a lot like the Diet Coke of the plant world. Um, it is a sugar rush. Um, it's mostly empty carbohydrates. Um, so it's pretty much like the birds are eating uh, white bread um, instead of having a nutritious meal. Um, and the ecological impact is pretty immense. So I mentioned those red berries, which first you'll see these flowers come up in the spring. You'll probably recognize them. They're gonna be popping up here soon. But as those uh, flowers are pollinated, they will turn into these red berries here. You've definitely seen these. Um, they're beautiful, they're striking. They don't do a lot for our environment. Uh, so birds need berries and seeds 
uh, that have a lot of high protein value and fat so that they can survive the winters. Um, the other bummer about these berries is because they're just kind of like empty calories for the birds, they eat a ton of them and then they fly around and they disperse the seeds by pooping them out. And then the seeds just grow everywhere. So um, the other thing about this plant is that when it establishes itself, it releases a chemical that is allelopathic, which means it kills all the other surrounding vegetation. So not only is this kind of like a fast food restaurant in a desert, like that's the only uh, sustenance that is provided because it's killing out all the other vegetation. Uh, it also spreads and just takes over very prolifically. So this plant, because it is non-native, uh, it's not native to North America and it damages the environment, it would be considered a non-native invasive plant. Um, so what you should do with it is, yeah, can you hand that to me? Yeah. So there, thankfully, uh, though it's really prolific, it spreads a lot. There are easy ways to get rid of it. So if it's small enough, you can get underneath the crown here using a shovel and kind of pop it out and get most of that, as long as it's rather small. Sometimes if it's smaller than this, you can pull it out by hand if the soil is soft. Now, if this plant is larger, what you'll wanna do is something called docking. And that means you're gonna cut it here. Oh no, go, yeah, docking down here. underneath it, yeah, pull. Like pop it under, get a pop bigger it under shovel. Yeah, and pop out this mm -hmm. this base here. Yeah, That's which called, is the crown, right? Yeah, 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 yeah the crown. So now, what what would you do, Alex, if this trunk were even larger than this? Is there another way that you can treat it? Yeah. So if if they're too big to dig up. And that can happen within like 10 to 15 years of a honeysuckle that's just left wild. Um, then you may have to resort to using um, a glyphosate uh, mm -hmm. roundup for bigger ones. Um, yeah, those so are the, the one, this one's probably about three or four years old mm -hmm. and it's still very easy to dig up. Yes, yeah. There's just so many of them out there. There are so many of them and there are some really big projects going mm -hmm. on around the city um, that where they're doing mass removal of bush honeysuckle. I'm really excited to see how those go. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So yeah, one kind of one other tip I want to mention, if you are going to treat with chemicals, you would cut it at the base of the trunk. Again, that's if the plant is a lot larger and then you would immediately brush or paint on that uh, chemical. So just make sure you read the instructions and are very careful when you're doing that. We always try to do hand pulling, hand digging before using chemicals, mm -hmm. um, but every situation is different and it's more about time management and resource management if you're trying to get rid of these things. Absolutely. Um, especially if you're trying to plant other things in its place, right? Because if you don't get rid of these plants, it's gonna kill everything you plant near it, right? Right. So um, once you remove it, there are some other great option, native plant options you can replace it with. One of my favorites is coral berry, which is also known as buck brush. Um, that is a nice low growing shrub that fountains over a lot like honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. And it has these vibrant magenta berries in the wintertime that feed and support wildlife. Uh, what are a couple other species that would be good replacements for this plant? Yeah, so uh, spice bush is another oh, one. It has plant. red berries. Oh, it's so beautiful. And it, and it hosts the spice bush swallowtail, which is such an amazing um, caterpillar and butterfly. Yes. Um, uh, clove currant would be a good one. Mm -hmm. Gooseberry. There's so many native Missouri shrubs that are much more um, uh, beneficial to wildlife um, nice. than, than this honeysuckle that's not beneficial to anyone. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, so let's go ahead and move on to the next plant. Um, this is also a very weedy plant. So Alex is going to tell us a little bit about winter creeper. Yeah. So this is our second, can I trade you? Yeah, Thank you. Um, this is another one of our big uh, uh, um, problem, uh, non-native invasives in the Kansas City area and in metropolitan areas. This is a uh, winter creeper and you can see, <laughs> We just pulled this one out, oops, yesterday. There you go. Um, and it's um, a uh, native or non-native, non invasive. It's planted as a ground cover um, by, I mean, you can still buy this in nurseries, unfortunately. Um, and it's uh, it spreads throughout full shade, full sun, almost any soil condition. 
except for really soggy, um, winter creeper can survive in that. And um, as a ground cover, I mean, it works pretty well because it shades out and, and takes up the space for everything else. But there's a problem when, if you've got it in a landscape situation, if it starts to climb um, mature trees, then it can start fruiting. And that is when you run into even bigger issues because you can see how it climbs up the trees here. And if left untreated, it can pull down and rob nutrients from this from giant mature trees. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets up into those trees, it will start to produce berries and spread even further. So this is a really, really bad one. You'll see carpets of it just covering walls. It can take down structures. Yeah. Um, it's escaped out into the natural world and um, it's, it's one of the really bad ones. When they're smaller, you can pull them out. They're pretty shallow rooted. Um, but they do root down at every, you can see this, how that piece there is rooted down from, a, uh, from one of the stems. Mm -hmm. um, but when it gets bigger and starts going up a tree and it has a, a bit more girth to it, mm -hmm. um, and if it gets up into the tree, the best way to do it is cut a chunk out of that stem and treat both sides of it in the late winter when all the rest of the plants are dormant, and then let that that uh, vine die off in the tree naturally. So you're not ripping it out and damaging the tree further. Yeah, so something I would love for you to touch upon is, so this plant came from um, Eastern Asia also, correct? That's right, yeah, so, same as bush honey. So. You know what I find interesting is that um, these uh, highly invasive plants thrive in our climate because our climate is very similar to that of where they are native to. So this, yeah. isn't, just, this isn't necessarily a bad plant. It's just not good here. It's in the wrong spot. It is in the wrong <laughs> spot. And the yes. reason for that is because it hasn't evolved in a way to have predators keep it in check. So okay. it just goes crazy, right? Yeah. It, it really loves our climate. So it thrives here, but there's nothing to help keep that balance in place. Right. There's no competition for this plant, right. no natural competition for this plant. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, so I covered like what, yeah, what, what you should do with it too. There are tons of native ground cover species mm -hmm. that can, that are way more beneficial to our wildlife than, than this one. Um, there are shade species such as Pacara, golden groundsel, mm -hmm. um, ginger, um, there are um, sun species, the Paracris sun species yeah. as well, wild strawberry, um, just any like full sun, rose verbena, right. coffee mallow, Pretty any much full just sun. the shorter ones, right? Like yeah, any covers. full sun brown yeah. cover would be a much better replacement for, for this kind of plant. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So now before we move on to our next plant, Sarah, do the folks out there have any questions yeah, about sorry. bush honeysuckle? <laughs> And winter creeper for us for our non-native invasives yeah. that are useless. Yes. To <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, Sharon would like to know uh, if I'm removing honeysuckle in the wooded area behind my house, uh, will the chemical hurt the wildlife? That's a great question. Great question. Um, we, I should not say we should we we will not officially be speaking on chemical uses in large areas. That is not our expertise at all. That's something you should get help with from, um, from higher up, from people who, who do these mass um, kill-offs of, of bush honeysuckle. What we tend to use for ours is a glyphosate mixture, which is, a, um, which is Roundup, but it's a weaker mixture than, um, uh, than the foliar spray. So it, we use it to paint that on instead. And right. that's the, uh, the, the latest studies I think show that that is the least harmful. We used to use Tordon um, mm -hmm. and we are, we've moved away from that to using a uh, 20% glyphosate mix, um, mm -hmm. which seems to leach out uh, in the roots less. Right. But like I said, we, we maybe use chemicals one time a year. Right. We're very lucky here and that we can mostly hand dig things out. So definitely do your research before you start mm -hmm. using a mass amount of chemicals on your land. Yeah, and one other thing I do wanna add is uh, with chemicals in general, it's always good to think about the weather too. So oh, regardless, yeah, definitely do your research and just please be aware, like if, if we're in rainy weather like this, the likelihood for that chemical to wash off and end up in our waterways and affect um, aquatic creatures is higher. So just yep. be aware of that, but uh, follow the instructions on the, the chemical package and you can contact uh, Missouri Department of Conservation state agents that can help um, yep. with uh, facilitating that information for larger scale projects. Yeah. 
Great question. Do we have uh, any questions about uh, winter creeper? Yes, thanks for answering that one um, and encouraging folks to reach out for help and to be safe and smart about uh, the ways that you are going about uh, treating these invasive species. I wonder if we could quickly revisit um, the whether a native plant can be invasive. We have uh, a couple of comments uh, suggesting uh, invasiveness of buckbrush or of wild strawberry. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between an aggressive native and an invasive species? Yeah, do you yes. mind if I take that one? Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. So, okay. So, native plants in and of themselves cannot be considered invasive, uh, mostly because they were they've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. However, they can be very prolific and aggressive. So, it is important to think about uh, right plant for the right place. And there are some plants I think of like river oats. Um, someone mentioned buckbrush or coral berry. That is technically a native plant that has ecological benefit. But if they um, don't have other plants to help, native plants to help keep them in check, uh, they do have the tendency to spread. And uh, but that just means that they're very prolific and aggressive. Um, yeah. Is there any other points you want to add to that? Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as we're going down the level of weediness. The last species that we're gonna talk about um, covers some of this too. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. we're talking we're I guess we should specify that we're more talking about in a um, smaller in a garden setting, um, mm -hmm. whereas some of the questions I see coming in are more on an agricultural level, mm -hmm. and that is not really what what we're talking about right here. We're kind of talking it's about not, what you can do. Over. In your it does cross yeah. over, sure. Yeah. But we would never recommend um, getting rid of a, a buck brush. There are some native species that do need control, such as mm -hmm. red cedars and sumacs, right. when you're talking about yeah. um, large agricultural um, settings, but yeah. uh, that that's not necessarily, I guess, what, what we'll cover. Today. Right, but you know what? That does raise a good point that about common names for plants. So yes. I don't know if you're talking about the buck brush that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so that's why it's really important to refer to the Latin name uh, when, if you're thinking about replacing a plant uh, to and to make sure that's a native uh, version of that plant because common names are as are they're arbitrary you know they're fun and they do give some context to the plant but a lot of like coral berry is buck brush and it has other names too yeah. so it's very confusing it could be misleading so. yeah and buck brush is also buck thorn which is a non-native invasive interesting so, yeah so it could be that. we're talking about symphiocarpos uh, or biculatus <laughs> <laughs> for buck brush yeah. but that is for that would be for a shady setting where you're actually on purpose planting a replacement for a bush yes. Yes. Okay, okay we're gonna move on <laughs> yes okay here we go so the next one we have this is one of my favorite non-native invasive species this is garlic mustard and this species we collected um in slow park yesterday and um it's a non-native invasive species that is taking over um, uh, or, or can take over areas and like we've seen it here in Kansas City in, in Parkland, specifically near very disturbed and very um, degraded areas. It can take a hold in there and cover in shaded areas and in full sun too. So um, this one is a biennial plant and it was an it's an escapee from um, uh, from a culinary garden. I was going to say, you can yes. eat it. So what can yes. you do with this plant? So you can, you can eat it. Um, this one is also, this is native to Europe and Asia, and it was moved over here into gardens for eating. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Hence the name garlic mustard. It's one of my favorite wild edibles because it does taste like garlic. It's so good. You yes. can use it in, sure. make a pesto with it. You can put it on pizza. You can um, cook it down and it's so tasty and right now is a great time to pick it because the leaves are very tender um, and tasty and they got that good garlic smell they're not too tough or bitter but they get tough and bitter when they're a bit older like this so he's going to show you this is the flower of it and that stands about 10 to 18 inches um, above the basal foliage and at that point, the, the leaves are a bit too tough to, um, to consume, but it's a really easy native plant to pull out and it's so, so tasty. So you get that benefit too. So real quick, before we move on to our fourth plant, because um, I see here we're 
running out of time, but we want to make sure we cover everything and have time for questions. Um, so this is a pretty invasive plant, right? Like, yeah. we're, I think it's number two on the list in the state of Missouri. Yes, it is. Yeah, number so two is, on the list. It looks very benign, but this spreads so prolifically. I read that it can spread in sun and shade. Yeah, so. sun and shade. It's a bad one. It's a real bad yeah. one, but it's so easy to pull and so easy to eat. Another one. Okay, here we go. This is dandelion. I'm sure y'all are familiar with this one. You've seen this before, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Everyone What's knows familiar? dandelion. Familiar? Yeah. Um, so dandelions, I will say there's a few controversial opinions about dandelions. What we're going to say here is that dandelions are non-native, but in Missouri, they are considered naturalized. Yeah. Now that's another controversial term, but basically what that means is that the dandelions are not stealing habitat right. from our native plants they're kind of finding their own niche in mm -hmm. in our ecosystem and so they're not necessarily they're not yeah so they're not in, they're not technically yeah. invasive they're from they're not from north america but yeah. again like alex is saying they're naturalized so they're not competing with native plants as right. much um so with this species yeah don't don't, do? don't plant them on purpose don't you don't need to like cultivate dandelions but if you have a few popping up on the edges of your beds or in your yard or whatever they're way better than turf grass yeah and they're way better than non-native invasive species that are spreading and crowding out native species and they can be i mean they are visited by native pollinators mm -hmm. and european honeybees which are not native either um but this is also an edible plant and every part of it is edible except for the stem um, I love this plant as a wild edible because the roots are edible. Uh, you can make a tea out of them. It's like a green tea. It's mm -hmm. so good. The leaves are edible too. You can cook them down. You can have them raw. You can put them, use them as a salad green. But my favorite way to cook them, it's not healthy at all. But <laughs> when, the, when they're flowering, the yellow flowers, if you dip them in batter and bread them and fry them, they taste like fried mushrooms. Oh, that they're sounds so, so good. good. I love and they're that. everywhere. They're everywhere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so before we move on to the last plant we're going to talk about today, yeah. um, we read something kind of interesting in uh, Deep Roots. Uh, email blast called the pollinator so they mentioned yes dandelions though they're technically not native they're not invasive um however there are other uh, native spring plants that are uh, much more important and beneficial to your wildlife yeah so nutrition wise these are not what our native insects need for uh springtime first bloom so there's a great list from the pollinator from big bot that's um mm -hmm. of of species that you can plant that are that are blooming in the springtime when dandelions would be blooming that are going to feed your native pollinators. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now for our last weedy plant. Uh, this is a native plant called that's the common a, violet. That's a little weed. Right? That's a little weed. So again, weeds are subjective, right? I love violets. I see them dotting my yard all over the place this time of year, and they look a lot like this. They're starting to come up, and they're, you can see their heart shaped leaves are kind of serrated on the edge they're really cute so violets are a native plant but a lot of people consider them weeds because they want pristine turf grass and whatnot um so i'm not latin's really important for identifying plants so this is sorry or uh viola sor soria sorority sororia. see latin's really hard so yeah so like the word sorority so what this uh what they're trying to say in latin is that these types of violets they have um, a lot of variation. They all look very similar, much like sisters, uh, but they have some subtle differences, mostly for this plant color. So you'll see them in purples, blues, like a white with purple veining. It's all the same type of plant, even though there are other species of violets here in Missouri. Um, so yeah, this is a native plant um, that is, uh, it's very common. And one cool thing about it is how it spreads. So it is pollinated by native pollinators like bumblebees. Um, but after that first flower um, comes up and dies back, a second flower during the summertime forms and it never opens, but it's full of seed and it actually shoots out the seed and spreads itself so well by seed, by pollination and by rhizomes, thus making it the common violet here in Missouri. And there's something else that you can do with violets, right? They're yeah. edible. Yes. Just like garlic mustard, which is a highly invasive plant, um, but uh, where that and common violet come together, though violet is native, is you can eat them. So mm -hmm. 
You can throw those leaves onto salads. They're high in vitamin A. And the flower petals are also edible. So something I want to do with them this year is make candied violets. So take the flower petal, make sure you, you get these from like a clean source. You don't want to pick them where there's like a lot of litter and or where like someone's that. been spraying for weeds. Yes. Because this is a weed that this is a broadleaf weed that is affected by pesticides that are commonly yeah. used after. Grass. That's a really good point. So make sure you're collecting from a clean source. Um, and there's recipes online that you can find, but essentially you candy them. They're covered in sugar. They're really cute. It retains the color and you can use them as like a little cupcake topper. Um, it's adorable. So that's something you can do with violets or just leave them because they are important for uh, early spring pollinators. So yeah, are they the host plant for- Oh gosh, that's right. I almost forgot. So this is so cool to me. Um, I love insects. I especially love butterflies and moths. But the violet has evolved for thousands of years to be a host plant for the great spangled fritillary butterfly <laughs> or fritillary. <laughs> Depends on how you want to say it. We looked up several, several ways to say it. The other day. <laughs> They're all anyway, different. but if we didn't have the violet, um, that butterfly wouldn't be able to reproduce and would disappear. So that connection is really important between uh, flora and fauna that are native to your eco region. So. Yeah. So I know we are cutting it real close on time, <laughs> but um, Sarah, if there are questions, we can now take the time to answer them um, about the five different types of weeds you can find in your backyard during winter time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think probably we've had just such an information packed uh, session today. Would you take some time to just really quickly define weed invasive, non-native again? Yes, absolutely. So I'll start off with weeds. Uh, that is a subjective term, but essentially a weed is a plant in, a, in the wrong place. Um, so that could mean it's um, an in invasive plant. Um, it could also mean it's just a plant that you simply don't want there that's not invasive. Um, so that is how I would define a weed. Yeah, our definition of weed here at the Discovery Center where we try to um, only have uh, native plants is any non-native invasive plants. Um, so the second tier is non-native naturalized plants like our dandelions, pinbit, uh, dead nettle, chickweed, mm -hmm. cleavers, these kinds of little weeds. Yeah. Um, so then an a non-native plant is one that is that was um, basically not here pre-Columbus. Right, um, it's brought yeah. over here. Brought over here by Europe Europeans. Or yeah. Asia, Asia yeah. you know, different plants that just haven't evolved right. in our eco-regions for yeah. hundreds of thousands of they years. May, they, they, and a lot of them do have uh, close relatives that are from here, which right. is a great replacement. Like the bush honeysuckle, we have native honeysuckles that That's you can true. replace it with. Yeah. yeah, but that, so like also with non-natives, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, really bad for the environment. So right. it's non-native is very simply, it's not from this eco-region. Yeah. Um, and then a uh, native plant means it has been in this environment for hundreds of thousands of years and has a very tight bond with the fauna, the local fauna here. Mm -hmm. And, and you, can, you can define native um, so close down to like even Kansas City native. Yeah. So we have some plants here at the Discovery Center because we are the Missouri Department of Conservation that are native to Missouri, but are not native to Kansas City. Right. A lot of the native plants that we have here are native to the Midwest, the Great Plains region. But it goes so far down as to like, I mean, there are plants that we only have like in one county in the boot heel of Missouri. So native's a little bit tricky there, but what basically is um, east of the Rockies, we have a certain set of plants yeah. and then there's west of the Rockies and they have um, a different set of native plants right. to boil it way down to yes. extremely basic. Extreme, yeah. extreme basic. <laughs> and then the last thing, the non-native invasive. These are the bad plants that you really want to take time to get rid of in your yards and parks. They are uh, destroying habitat for other native plants. Um, I mean, we're losing species because of non-native invasive plants like bush honeysuckle, winter creeper, and garlic mustard, yeah. which are three of the five plants we discussed right. today. Because when you kill off the host plants for our native insects, Native insects are native bird food. Yep. So you're killing off the bird food, you're killing off the baby birds, yep. they have no caterpillars to eat. 
then you're killing off the birds, then you're going up the food chain right. all the way up to mammals. It goes all the way to the top. All the way to the top. It's all connected. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question about the definitions of uh, that we've discussed today. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for going over that again. Appreciate it. Um, let's do one quick one. Um, so this has come up a couple of times. Can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, non-native vining honeysuckle and how that's yeah. different to, from shrub honeysuckle? Okay, go for it. Yeah. Okay. So non-native vining honeysuckle, that is Lonastera uh, haponica. And that one is uh, the, the vining a uh, Japanese honeysuckle. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the, the, the bush one is bush honeysuckle or, uh, the Japanese um, honeysuckle is the common name. Yeah, yeah. Or Japanese honeysuckle is the common name for the vining honeysuckle and it has white to yellow flowers as well, but it has blackberries instead of red berries. And it's another really, really bad one in Kansas City. Now, I actually don't know if it is allelopathic. That might make it slightly less terrible than bush honeysuckle, but it's another one to look out for, for sure. And if we had a list to go through of the whole city, it would probably be number three or four yeah. on the list of, right. of bad urban non-native invasive species. So definitely get rid of your Japanese honeysuckle too. That one's even easier to replace because our native honey, two of our native oh. honeysuckles are vining. And oh my Gorgeous. gosh, they do you like beautiful. hummingbirds? Have you ever heard of hummingbirds? <laughs> yeah, and do you, you like, like bright red, pink flowers? Because yeah. uh, get the native honeysuckle then. And it's what is so it called? Beautiful. The coral honeysuckle? Yeah, there's coral honeysuckle. Yeah, and the yellow honeysuckle too. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're hummingbird magnets. They're so yeah, beautiful. so pretty. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Sarah, I don't know if we have time for one more question, but um, before we do, just a reminder, allelopathic means it's that chemical okay. that uh, these invade, some of these invasive plants leach out that kill all the other plants around it. It's a defense mechanism. Yeah, and it's very effective. Very effective. All right, thanks. Oh no, thanks so much, um, you guys. I don't think that we have time for another one, um, but I'll just share a couple of quick things. And of course, um, if you have questions we didn't get to today, uh, feel free to send those by email. We'll do our best to um, answer those or get you in touch with Alex and Sydney. So um, speaking of that, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the native landscape at the Discovery Center or ask your questions about invasive species, um, please sign up for the first Friday landscape chats. Um, bring your mask and uh, dress for the weather. On the first Friday of each month, Alex and Sydney will guide you around the landscaping at the Discovery Center and answer your questions. You'll need to register at the link on your screen and space is limited for those. In addition to the year-long Native Plants at Noon series, Deep Roots is also doing a, an evening series of webinars this spring. Um, you can find our upcoming webinars at deeproots.org. Look for events at the top of the screen. Our next one in that evening series will be Tuesday, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. when Mary Nemesek, who is Conservation Chair of Burroughs Audubon, will give you some concrete steps to make your yard more welcoming to birds. If all this education has left you feeling inspired to add more native plants to your yard, and we certainly hope that it has, um, please get your pre-orders in now for our native plant sale on Saturday, April 10th uh, at the Prairie Village Pool parking lot. Um, please visit deeprootskc.org slash plant sale to order. And we'd like to offer a huge thanks to our six vendors who will be contributing a portion of their proceeds to Deep Roots efforts. Uh, if you notice, they do have some varying deadlines there for your pre-orders, so please check those out and get them in as soon as you are able. As always, while you're on our website, we'd be deeply grateful if you would consider making a donation to Deep Roots to help us continue providing free native plant education. You'll find that uh, donate button in the upper right corner of your screen. And as we close today, um, please click continue on the screen that will pop up. We have a short survey for you that we'd love for you to take uh, that will help us improve the offerings uh, that we have to present to you and also do uh, a little bit of research uh, about the trees that you may have in your yard. So please take a look at that and take just a couple of minutes to answer that. And that's all for today. We will see you at our next 
uh, Native Plants at Noon on April 15th. Look forward to it. Thanks so much. Take care.